so hi. Uh, my name is Orshaya, but everyone calls me Orshi for obvious reasons. So we are going to stick with that. And actually, we are going to go back slightly, not as far as the Iron Age. We are going to talk about uh, medieval urbanity and food in high medieval times today. Uh, but I will mention some Iron Age uh, excavations going on at the moment later. So. I am a PhD student, but also currently acting as a teaching fellow at the University of Aberdeen. And my main area of studies is actually looking into dietary change from the late Iron Age to the high medieval period. Um, and today I will be focusing on the high medieval period. And uh, why is this actually quite interesting? Well, this is obviously, this is the time when you have the first appearing royal boroughs, which is really important in terms of developing ur urban landscapes and uh, the the uh, from uh, the people from all over scotland and the uk start to arrive to these new centers and we don't really uh, we have historical records but these can be sometimes scarce and they often focus on a certain type of uh, demographic as well ignoring other ones uh, you don't really have uh, any scribes kind of following around average Joe uh, and this doesn't really happen today either. I have never had anyone following me to Morrison's and asking me about my dietary adventures. So this is kind of what we are trying to fix and uh, see whether whether there's sort, some sort of um, expression uh, of identity in these dietscapes. And what I'm doing, I'm uh, studying stable isotopes and uh, I'm going to try to co cross compare ecclesiastical and lay communities uh, from different sites. But before I get there, I think it's quite important to just sort of really briefly establish the methods that I use and, and why they are valid. Um, so I, I study stable isotopes. Basically, isotopes are different forms of the same chemical element. And we all contain isotopes because uh, whatever we drink, whatever we uh, eat, kind of gets incorporated into our bodies. So we are what we eat, kind of, because um, there's certain, certain things going on, uh, chemical processes in our bodies. So there's something called fractionation going on. So uh, isotopes get incorporated into the vegetation, from the vegetation into the fauna, from the fauna and vegetation into our own bodies. Uh, and there's various effects that you can see uh, from these isotopes. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about carbon and nitrogen today. In terms of nitrogen, it's really important to know that you can have these various trophic level effects. Basically, if you are looking at a uh, faunal baseline that you can see over there. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So what you will see is that at the, at the bottom end over there, uh, you will have the herbivores, herbivorous animals. And as you go up further up in the food chain, uh, you will have ele more elevated nitrogen 15 values and you will have higher trophic level animals. So you will have the carnivores way up, but also when it comes to marine uh, systems, there's food chains are really long in marine ecosystems. And because of this, you will have really, really elevated nitrogen uh, values in comparison. So that's why you can differentiate between terrestrial food stuff and marine food stuff as well, which is really useful, especially in uh, medieval Scotland. Um, and in terms of carbon, you can also see the effect of marine uh, foodstuff being incorporated into our bodies with elevated carbon. So you will see uh, marine, uh, marine foods on the right side. Um, you could also see a difference between C3 and C4 plants. C4 plants are, however, tropical grasses like maize and such. And I do not expect to see any tropical grasses in Scotland uh, during this time period. So we are going to ignore that. All right, so I will be talking about three particular sites which are uh, the main focus of, my, of this part of my research. And these are Aberdeen, uh, Perth and Edinburgh. Uh, these are all royal boroughs uh, developing uh, from fairly, uh, uh, they have a, a fairly similar early history. And uh, they also contain some really interesting, uh, interesting sites that we are going to be addressing now. So in terms of Aberdeen, <clears throat> This is a picture of New Aberdeen. Uh, the city itself can be divided into Old Aberdeen and New Aberdeen. And there have been a lot of excavations recently in New Aberdeen in the harbour area. 
Um, and this is a particularly important area because of the urban development due to the harbour itself. Uh, one of the sites that we are going to be looking at is St. Nicholas Kirk, which uh, has already developed uh, before 1157, which is the first time it was actually mentioned. But by the 15th century, this became the largest borough uh, church of Scotland. And the, the people of, of actually attending the sermons in this area were really the, the richer individuals of Aberdeen. Uh, there's a lot of evidence of them kind of being really financially kind to the Kirk itself. Uh, so we are going to talk about them. And then we are going to uh, look at the Carmelite uh, Friary from Aberdeen, which, is, which incorporates both lower status but mid status uh, lay individuals as well as uh, potential uh, friars themselves. This was a, a community that opened up to the Aberdonians and a lot of families decided to be buried in here uh, because of this. They had a really close relationship with the people. Uh, the Dominican friars kind of, this is a really fresh uh, study which has been uh, done. So there was an excavation done at the uh, art gallery site by AOC Archaeology. And we have some really interesting data from there that I will show you. And this friary kind of opened up a bit later towards the people. So it actually contains a lot of the friars themselves and the lay brothers. It has a large population, which is um, in majority male. We do have females as well, of course, because eventually they did open towards the people. And uh, the Franciscan friary is where currently uh, Marshall College is standing. And this is a really prominent building at the moment. Uh, it used to be the place of the Franciscan friary, and this is quite a unique um, site in a sense that it, we have a really limited time range where the Franciscans were present in Aberdeen. They arrived in 1469, but they had to leave pretty quickly in 1560 for reasons of reformation and such. Um, and the majority of these sites essentially um, ceased to exist except for St. Nicholas Kirk. And uh, uh, the cemeteries sometimes were uh, used longer than that, however. So before we look at the graphs, uh, before, before I actually show you the human data, I need to show you the faunal data. It's really important to kind of compare the human individuals to the uh, local fauna, uh, because, the, because the baselines, the, that the various uh, fauna that we eat can change isotopically, geographically, and through time as well. So all the faunal baseline that I will show you will be local to the given uh, city, and it will be also contemporary. So looking at our high status uh, St. Nicholas Kirk individuals, what we see here is a huge amount of variability. We have also we have an individual who he kind of looks like a seal from an isotopic perspective. It is a person we checked. Um, <laughs> But we're confused. And also we were, we were actually uh, curious whether this might be perhaps a Scandinavian individual. So we did some mobility studies, but it's just a local Abertonian. Um, interesting. But uh, so we see this, uh, this large variability here in a high status site. Um, uh, and we are, we are not really sure if this is, uh, this is to do with timing, because obviously we are looking at 12th to 15th centuries. This is a wide range of time period that we are looking at here. So we are trying to work through the phasing of the site to see whether uh, perhaps the earlier individuals are present more in the lower end of the scale, which would mean high protein diet, incorporation of some marine food stuff, but not as much as at the higher end over there. This is our low status Carmelite uh, friary from Aberdeen, and they look very similar. You have a huge amount of variability. You have a lot of people who seem to be consuming not so much, uh, not so much marine fish, but really high protein diet still. But then you have individuals who are really relying on that marine fish quite a bit. And uh, the cu curious thing is that we have a low status and a high status burial ground, and they are representing the same sort of time period, and they are showing the same sort of variability as well. Now, how are our Dominicans doing? Very similar, extreme amount of variability again. Um, this site just uh, received some radiocarbon dates uh, from SWERC, so they are going through the phasing of the site itself. So I'm really hopeful that we are going to be able to incorporate that into this 
uh, data set and, and talk about it in, in more detail soon. Um, you also might notice that there's an individual over there um, that kind of, uh, that could potentially be the first medieval vegan. <laughs> we were so excited. We were really excited. Um, uh, so we, but we, 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 we didn't want to obviously just assume. So we sent away this particular sample for further studies uh, by something called Zooms, which helps us speciate uh, different bone fragments that you can't really tell apart. So um, it's not a medieval vegan, it's a cow. <laughs> but <laughs> terrible. Um, but it really shows you. So this came, this particular sample was a rib sample that came from a cemetery ground from an articulated uh, burial ground. So it basically during it, what it seems to be during the backfilling of the site, somehow that rib part managed to get into the rough area where the human rib cage was as well. So it kind of shows you how you really need to be considering everything apparently because it came from the right area. It was a rib section. It was a tiny one as well. So you couldn't really say that it wasn't human. So yes. Unfortunate. And where are our friars? Uh, so what I didn't say about the Franciscan friar uh, is that all they were only seven individuals at this particular site and they were all determined to be friars. Um, they were all radiocarbon dated and they were all buried with their hands clasped in prayer. Uh, they also had some artifactual evidence pointing, pointing to this, to, to them being friars. So we're quite interested to see whether uh, this religious lifestyle would perhaps appear uh, and we would see perhaps a high consumption of marine fish because obviously after the Benedictine rule there was this um, focus on fish consumption during fasting periods because you were not supposed to eat the four-legged creatures of the earth and fish is not one of them so there we go and indeed they're really really fishy which is really good uh, in terms of this is really good kind of uh, evidence of the expression of religiosity because Franciscan friars are famous for uh, for kind of trying to uh, stay in poverty. Um, but at the same time, we have all these high status individuals which are following the same sort of rules. So what are we actually seeing? Um, we went on and looked at some sites at Perth as well. So today uh, I will talk to you about aside from St. John's Kirk, which is a, a really quite uh, strict uh, uh, sort of uh, time range. We are talking about a 16th century uh, burial ground of, uh, of a few individual, a few adult individuals only. Um, th uh, then we are going to talk about Horse Cross as well, which was really well excavated and has been reported actually in, a, in many of the journals. And uh, we are talking about here some individuals who based on the, the osteological evidence. They could have been uh, around mid status. These are labor, lay burials, potentially either a family group or workers um, and also a murder victim. And Elko Nunnery, which uh, unfortunately a lot of the, the uh, finds from here were quite fragmented and also disturbed. So only, we only have a few individuals that I could actually study um, and we have both both nuns here, as well as uh, possibly lay brothers and the general populace. And we are going to talk about the Carmelite friary as well, the white friars. Now this, I only have about five data points for you today. I'm currently awaiting additional 50. So this will be actually the largest uh, data, scale, uh, data set from Perth. And I'm really quite excited about this one. So let's look at this. So here you can see, these are the St. Uh, John's Kirk individuals. What you see here is there's the similar variability that you could see in Aberdeen, just slightly more limited and slightly actually skewed towards the more, the, the more terrestrial end of things. They're not really focusing much on marine food stuff. Now, this is Horse Cross. Again, very similar, uh, very similar, much more limited variability. Um, now this is uh, Elko Nunnery and the individual up there is actually a, is a male um, and 
seems rather weird in this data set. It seems like an absolute weirdo. However, it might not be a weirdo. It might just be an Aberdonian, for example. If you, <laughs> if you remember um, the previous slides, you will see they were all quite high up. He would still be in the higher end of things, even in Aberdeen, though. So he's quite interesting. All the other individuals seem to kind of fit this, this more limited uh, range, which perhaps is not so surprising, even though Perth uh, developed much like Aberdeen, uh, g uh, gained this royal borough status and was really important in terms of overseas trade before the silting up of the Tay. Um, uh, Perth is also quite uh, famous of its fertile lands, so perhaps this focus on more terrestrial food stuff might not be as surprising as, as we think. Now, this is these are the um, the white friars. And the interesting, what I found quite interesting is that the two burials that are up at the top end, they were both individuals who were identified to have uh, staffs. So it's a question whether, whether there's something to do with religiosity here being expressed via food ways. So I will be really curious when the, all the other data comes back, because this is just five individuals, 45 more to come, that will actually give us a much better idea in terms of what we are actually seeing. Now, in comparison, we also looked at Edinburgh. Uh, two sites in particular. Edinburgh, again, gained royal status by uh, David I. And uh, well, I looked at St. Giles Cathedral, which has been really, it was a really well-faced site and, uh, and well-reported. So actually, I was able to do a comparison between two different faces uh, that you will see soon, and Holyrood Abbey. Now, the individuals buried at Holyrood Abbey actually uh, are lower status individuals. They were not part of uh, the Abbey itself, but it looks like they were uh, perhaps workers of the Abbey based on the archaeological evidence, or they were just uh, the lower status individuals based on osteological and artifactual evidence as well. So this is St. Giles uh, Cathedral, and what you see here is uh, there are two outliers in terms of uh, the later phase there. However, all the, the majority of the individuals coming from the later phase, from, 12th, uh, from the 14th to the 16th century, they seem to be consuming a lot more fish than the earlier individuals. And in the earlier phase, you have this kind of bimodal distribution um, of individuals consuming uh, some, uh, some fish and a high protein diet, but not really focusing on this so much as the later ones. It's a really clear differentiation between these two groups. Now, the, how does the lower, uh, the lower status burial of, of, uh, of the Holyrood uh, Cemetery compare to this? They're all these now. They are all with the lower uh, terrestrial, uh, the more terrestrial food consumption uh, at the lower end over there. Now, the reason why this is interesting is because the Holyrood Abbey individuals actually come from the same time period as the later Saint Giles individuals who are consuming a lot of fish. So we have evidence of status difference as well as difference through time. So this is why it's really important to incorporate additional radiocarbon dates uh, and additional uh, phasing information to be able to potentially differentiate uh, between such information. To kind of show you how, where, where uh, these Scottish sites are in terms of uh, UK uh, isotopic data sets. So all the blue ones are our Scottish sites. And you can see Perth, at the lower end of the scale there, um, and with very little variability between the different sites. And uh, I have omitted white fryers from this because obviously I only have the five individuals, so that would be underrepresenting quite a lot. <laughs> so um, I, will, I will include it as eventually. And you can see the differenti clear differentiation in terms of diet with the sites from Edinburgh. Now, this uh, green, uh, green uh, data point there is, uh, comes from Whithorn. These are the bishops of Whithorn who have been interpreted as consuming a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, marine food stuff due to their religiosity. Now, just to kind of put this into perspective, um, hello, green fri Grey Friars of Aberdeen. They are the fishiest ape in the entire UK at this point in time. So we are really proud of that. Um, and, um, and I think this is an extremely interesting data set. Uh, I will suspect 
that, uh, that the white friars from Perth will be roughly Section over there, so they will be. They so far they seem to be slightly more elevated in terms of nitrogen and carbon. However, I can't really obviously say that until I actually get the rest of the data. But this is a really interesting difference between different cities of medieval Scotland of the developing urban of these developing urban landscapes. Um, so they tell a very different story and different focus of the people within these cities from a dietary perspective. Now, just to show you uh, where we are going to go with this, this is extremely fresh data. I got this five days ago. Um, so uh, I was looking at some of the Franciscan friars and I'm trying to find out whether you could potentially see when an individual would have joined the friary and started to focus on, on uh, the fasting days and consume more and more fish. So what, what I did, I sequentially sampled uh, second molar and the third molar. Now teeth do not remodel like uh, bones do and you, we have a really we know how teeth grow sequentially so we can actually associate different time periods uh, with, uh, of life within the tooth if we do this, this kind of sampling. So I could look at uh, the life of this individual from when he was two and a half years old up to 23 and a half years old. So what I saw is uh, uh, first, you can see a little bit of a dip here. A little bit of a dip in terms of uh, nitrogen and carbon, which is really typical of. Uh, oh, one minute! I'll I'll try and speed up. So this is really typical uh, from chil uh, in children. They of often don't really eat much, but like uh, but porridge, for example. So this is extremely typical. And then you see a rise. So that's, uh, that's the children kind of going towards more of an adult diet. And then you see another rise up to an extremely fishy diet. Now the question is, is this to do with him joining the friary or is this to do with him becoming an adult? So uh, what, we, what I'm doing now is I'm looking at uh, another friar to compare and some lay individuals from St. Nicholas Kirk, high status as well as low status, to be able to cross compare what's actually going on if it's an adult thing. Is it, a, uh, is it a monastic thing? And then the idea would be to kind of do the same thing uh, at the different uh, monastic sites and lay sites of Scotland. And ideally, the best start would be, to be honest, uh, White Friars of Perth. So that would be kind of, that's what's going to happen soon, hopefully. So I have some teeth currently in acid, so I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> and just, uh, just this sort of, uh, uh, tell you what's going on at the moment. Like I said, I am also working on early medieval and late Iron Age diets. So at Aberdeen, we are really quite proud of, uh, of our um, cooperative skills with one another. So there's a, we have a project, the Com Comparative Kingship Project, and they, are, they have been excavating tirelessly uh, at various sites, uh, trying to, and, and I have been working on many of the fauna remains. Uh, that were uncovered at these sites to kind of understand the local baseline of early medieval Scotland better. So at the moment they are at Craig Rock and our master students actually braved the weather and hopefully are going to bring back some uh, amazing fauna remains because they have done some test pitting at this site previously. And, uh, and it looks like that the preservation is absolutely amazing. So thank you very much for listening to me.